This webcast is the first in a series designed to provide a strong foundation for RF engineers learning LTE technology. Joining us to present today is Frank Palmer. Frank joined HP Agilent in 1986 as a product marketing engineer for portable spectrum analyzers. He's held positions as wireless industry marketing manager and wireless applications engineer, where he was responsible for understanding the test requirements of the diverse wireless communications industry. He has authored and delivered various technical papers at in industry symposia and seminars, including numerous LTE training classes. Frank is currently a worldwide wireless and LTE industry lead. We'll begin today's webcast in just a moment, but first a little bit about the process. Frank will answer questions at the end of his presentation today. To participate in the Q&A session, you can enter questions at any time during this presentation in the question window on the lower right-hand side. Be sure to address your questions directly to all panelists by clicking on the pull-down menu. We have a lot of people online with us today, so I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions. But don't worry, if we run out of time, we will respond to the remaining questions via email. We also ask that you take a moment to fill out the short feedback form that will appear when you close the WebEx session. Now let's move on to the presentation. Welcome, Frank. You now have the floor. All right. Well, uh, let me get there. Thank you, Allison. So again, everyone, um, welcome uh, to part one here of this webcast that's based in part on the second edition of uh, Agilent's LTE book. This is the agenda. We'll first spend a, a few minutes discussing why and what LTE is. And then this is followed by a uh, fundamental discussion on the RF aspects of the air interface. And then we'll go about and talk about uh, some of the uh, approaches towards testing transmitters and receivers uh, before ending with uh, time for question and answers. There uh, also is a part two uh, separate follow-on webcast, and that's going to cover uh, MIMO concepts, and it's more focused on LT Advance, uh, his uh, features and design challenges. So let's get started with LT and what's driving it. Well, we're, we're always looking forward to modifying uh, the existing technologies or creating new ones in order to improve the data rate. Um, the data rate is one, you know, having higher data rates is something that's really driving, uh, driving these systems. In addition, operators are looking for backwards compatibility. And then obviously, they all want lower complexity and they want to continue on with uh, cost reduction, reducing their uh, capital expenditures. And the all IP core uh, packet switch system helps uh, in part to support those goals. And some of the significant requirements for LTE are the uh, higher mobility with access across the network at up to 350 um, kilometers per hour. Uh, improved uh, latency, which is down from 150 milliseconds for UMTS down to 10 milliseconds, uh, and because of the effect that it has on the, the user's experience, particularly in some of the voice applications like uh, voice IP and other latent sensitivity sensitive applications like uh, gaming. And then there are uh, required spectral efficiency um, numbers, uh, hoping to get something like three times um, improvement over what HSDPA was. Now, before I can get to some of the details on LT, I just want to take a moment here to, to let you see and talk about where the standards come from. The um, International Telecommunications Union, or the ITU is what it's called, it's a, uh, a United Nations agency for information and uh, communication technologies. And it has three major activities, standardization, development, and radio communications. It plays a key role in the, um, the global management of the RF spectrum, and it ended up developing the uh, IMT framework of standards. And here I'm showing on the left the uh, IMT 2000 and the IMT Advanced um, standards. There's uh, international or the regional standard bodies, such as ARB in Japan or ETSI in uh, Europe. What they've done is they uh, individually and more recently collaboratively um, as uh, the 3GPP submitted proposals for these standards, with the LT Advance uh, proposal being the one that's submitted uh, to meet the IMT Advance, 
which is also known um, as the true 4G. And you may notice down here that the highest data rate uh, listed is, is 1 gigabits per second for this IMT advanced uh, standard. And, and LTE itself uh, doesn't, doesn't meet that. That's the number for uh, LTE advanced. So how does LTE fit in? Well, looking at this timeline of 3GPP releases, the um, LTE is, is just, as that name implies, it's really an evolution of technologies. Um, it's, UMTS actually started back in 2000 with uh, release 99 um, for uh, WCDMA, and then it's kind of continued on through release 7, where uh, LT was first discussed as a uh, study item. And then in uh, December of 2008 with uh, release 8, it was actually fixed um, as the first standard. And then there's the follow-on enhancements that then go to further define uh, uh, LT or evolve it into um, LT advanced. So let's take a look at some of the key um, technical features. And as we're talking about some of these, let's, maybe you want to keep in mind some of those motivation um, and goals that we discussed earlier. So access mode. Um, LTE uses both frequency division duplex and time division duplex. Um, for FTD, the uplink and the downlink have dedicated frequency bands. And for TDD, the uplink and downlink share the frequency band over time. And we also refer to these as uh, using paired and unpaired spectrum. The, more, the majority of systems that have been deployed already uh, use FTD, but uh, TDD is looking to grow, particularly as China Mobile um, rolls out its system uh, later this year. Channel bandwidth. Um, LTE has uh, flexible channel bandwidth from 1.4 megahertz up to 20 megahertz with the uh, wider 10, 15, and 20 uh, megahertz really targeted for new spectrum use and the much higher data rates. The transmission schemes, um, there's two different uh, for the uplink and downlink, uh, OFDMA and SCFDMA, and we'll talk about this more in detail in a few minutes. Uh, modulation formats, well, there's really a um, selection of now higher order based um, uh, modulation formats, uh, and those can be selected based on the specific radio channel conditions. MIMO technology, I'll just say that uh, it's a multiple antenna technique which is used to improve the, the data capacity, and we're going to discuss that more uh, in detail in part two of the webcast. The peak data rates, uh, LTE aims to have uh, up to 300 megabits per second uh, peak data rate, and that's with uh, a 64 QAM modulation and uh, a four, four layers or 4x4 four four MIMO, and obviously the uh, widest uh, channel bandwidth. And I might add that that is under ideal conditions. And for the uplink, that's a, it's a 75 megabits uh, per second peak data rate. Under bearer services, LTE uses a, a packet switch um, only, so um, it's going to end up having to use voice over IP for voice communications with um, some guaranteed bit rate. And this requires uh, priority handling or some level of uh, quality of service implementation. And then there's the transmission time interval, or, or TTI. Um, the TTI is the time it takes to transmit one block of data. And this has been significantly reduced from the previous uh, systems. And one of the significance of that is that it's uh, really a, a key part of the smallest time or the smallest interval over which uh, the channel conditions can be reported and thus adjusted. So let's now move to discuss some of the error interface concepts, starting with the uh, frequency bands. This table here shows the frequency bands for FDDD, FDD. Um, it's inherited actually all of the existing UMTS bands uh, back in uh, from 2008 when the specs were actually fixed, and then some additional new ones have been added since. Um, if you look at the frequencies there, um, you can see that there's an overlap or subsets of frequencies, and that means that for many of the existing um, power amplifiers and uh, receivers that uh, the RF coverage um, in those areas may not be an issue. But, um, however, the uh, narrower duplex spacing and the gaps, 
that's going to make it uh, hard to design filters that uh, prevent the transmitter spectral regrowth uh, from leaking into the receivers. And also, it, um, it adds complexity to designing the multiple antennas. So in other words, it's, it's about uh, the ability to implement the multiple bands in the devices is where, uh, where that can cause some issues. Um, here are the TDD bands. Um, for TDD, there's no concept of duplex spacing or gaps since the downlink and the uplink um, frequencies are, are uh, the same, so they're transmitted on the same band. And so the challenge there of separating the transmit from the receive doesn't end, fall, end up falling on the duplex filter that's used in the frequency domain, um, but rather it's a switch that's used for the time domain. The OFDM enables flexible transmission bandwidth. Uh, the transmission bandwidth is determined independently by the number of active uh, subcarriers or RBs or resource blocks. Um, and this gives the LTE the flexibility to have six different configurations that range from 1.4 megahertz up to uh, 20 megahertz. The channel bandwidth here is defined in megahertz. Um, it's the nominal occupied channel, or the also known as the channel spacing. The transmission bandwidth configuration is defined in units of RB, and it's the maximum number of RBs that uh, you can have for a given channel bandwidth. And then we have the transmission bandwidth, and it's also defined in RBs, and it's the, the number of RBs that are allocated to any specific transmission. And that number can vary anywhere from one all the way to the actual uh, transmission bandwidth configuration. So OFDM, or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. What that is, it's a multi-carrier modulation or transmission scheme that uh, divides the carrier frequency into a large number of uh, closely spaced orthogonal subcarriers. The multi-carrier scheme achieves these transmission efficiencies, which, which end up being um, similar to some of the traditional uh, single-carrier schemes, but it ends up doing this with uh, better immunity to some of the common channel impairments. And it can do this by using a proportionately slower symbol rate as compared to the, the single-carrier schemes. Now, the scheme is, is robust, ends up being robust in the presence of single uh, frequency interferes and, uh, and some of the noise, but, um, but because it, it, it's um, very robust in that sense because if you end up losing a carrier or if you end up losing um, a couple of carriers, it's not, it's not uh, completely fatal to the entire transmission. Typically, these uh, lost bits can be recovered uh, through many of the uh, error correction algorithms. So if we're looking at the, the single carrier, um, or the single subcarrier, the rate of change of the phase modulation determines the position of the zero crossings. And so if we can think of the, the subcarrier modulation rate, uh, we, excuse me, if we can link the subcarrier modulation rate to the subcarrier frequency spacing in a way that the nulls of the spectrum of one of the subcarriers can line up with the peaks in the adjacent subcarriers, we can end up getting orthogonality for the subcarriers. And then we can end up with a spectrum similar to this. And so what it does is it ends up operating as an orthogonal narrow band system. And the spacing creates the orthogonality. And then we have phase noise along with frequency and timing assets that end up working against that orthogonality. Now, um, we can remember that if we look at this, you can see that each of these assigned carriers has a modulation symbol that ends up modifying its magnitude and phase. And these here are all shown at the constant amplitude. And obviously, we know that's not the case. Um, we have non-constant amplitude modulations such as the 16 or 64 QAM, and uh, those, those can be used. We talked about that uh, with respect to um, uh, changing those modulation based on, on link, uh, link conditions. Now, the number of subcarriers that are assigned to each user 
can vary depending on the data rate. And so as the data is spread out over this number of subcarriers, it's uh, less susceptible to single frequency interference and uh, multipath dropouts. LTE itself, it ends up using a form of OSDM called OSDMA, which is orthogonal frequency division multiple access, which is uh, more flexible. And it, it uh, allows subcarriers to be allocated to different users in time and frequency. And this provides really a much needed frequency diversity for these low um, data rate cases, which um, are narrow frequency allocations that end up being susceptible to narrow band fading. Uh, typically, the, the channel pattern per user will frequency hop after each symbol or every few symbols. And, and this hopping is one way to provide better immunity to the, the fading versus the static assignments. So there's several advantages to OFDM, um, including uh, its scalability in the frequency domain and its support of frequency selective scheduling within the channel. Uh, there's uh, wide channels that can be created which allow for high data rates when, of course, that's when the spectrum is available. And then there's the long symbols in OFDM. What it does is it allows symbol extension using a, a cyclic prefix in order to completely avoid uh, multipath distortion. The, and it does this with the, the insertion of a guard period or a guard interval, and they insert that in between each symbol, and that in eliminates all of the um, inner symbol interference um, so long as the length of that period is longer than the multipath delay, uh, delay spread in, in the radio channel. And unfortunately, of course, though, with things there are some disadvantages to, the close uh, subcarriers are susceptible to frequency errors and phase noise, which end up creating inner carrier interference, and there's uh, double-sided Doppler shift that's caused by sig signals coming from, uh, at the same time, coming from the front and the back due to um, reflections. And that's particularly hard to deal with and can require a, a large amount of DSP computation in, in order to address. And then, of course, at, uh, we'll also see in a little bit here um, the, uh, the subcarries in OSDM signals they combine to create high peak to average ratios in the time domain. And this creates compression and spectral regrowth uh, problems for amplifiers that can be um, expensive and, and kind of timely to, uh, to deal with. Single carrier frequency division multiple access, um, it's a, a new concept in the transmission and it's used in the uplink for data transmissions only. And this diagram here um, shows that approach now, SCD, SCFDMA is what we call a hybrid transmission scheme. Um, it's one that really tries to combine um, the best characteristics of single carrier systems, like the low peak to average ratio, and combines that, tries to combine that with some of the frequency domain flexibility and uh, the, the multipath resistance that we have in uh, OFDMA. So let's try to compare the two and uh, we can start off doing that by taking a, a physical view of how the OFDMA and F, FC FDMA look in the time and frequency domains. And we're going to do that by uh, taking a look at the transmission of this um, series of um, eight PS, QPSK symbols. Now, on the left, I have uh, the OFDMA, um, which is really the simpler of the two schemes. Um, it has it has a one-to-one -one relationship between the modulating data and the uh, subcarriers. And now, since this is just a uh, four subcarrier example here, we've got the four data symbols that are here. Um, they're all going to be transmitted in parallel, and they each end up occupying 15 kilohertz of bandwidth. And so for those four, that total is 60 kilohertz. And then after these first four symbols are uh, transmitted, then what we do is we take the next four as a group. Now, for SCFDMA, the process that, that we go through looks actually um, very different. Excuse me. Um, each of these uh, modulating data symbols occupies the, the full um, 60 kilohertz bandwidth, and they are, end up being transmitted sequentially 
which is more like a single carrier um, type of scheme. So let's take a look now at how these schemes go about actually generating the signals. And we'll start with the OFDMA. So here in this example, I have four um, subcarriers down here. The, you can see that they're all spaced 15 kilohertz apart, and each one is shifted by the QPSK symbol. So you can see the different uh, uh, different phase relationships there. Now, this, this final waveform here is just uh, simply a summation of these subcarriers. Now, the randomness of that uh, final waveform here um, actually will increase as we increase the number of subcarriers, and and in the limit this uh, composite waveform ends up resembling Gaussian noise. And as if we know, Gaussian noise has, uh, the Gaussian noise distribution has a very high peak to average ratio. Well, for S SCFDMA, um, the signal um, generation process really starts by creating time domain waveforms. So here's our QPSK symbols that uh, we're going to go through. Um, these points, and they all go through in one SC FDMA symbol, and that symbol uh, length is the same for OFDMA in, in this example as well. So we start by creating uh, the time domain signals, and then these time domain signals are converted to frequency um, by a dis discrete Fourier transform, and it's created such that they can be represented by these uh, four uh, four bins that are spaced at 15 kilohertz apart. And then what we end up doing is we shift these to uh, the correct place in the channel bandwidth that, uh, that we want, and we end up then taking this frequency shifted uh, signal and uh, converting it back to the time domain with the inverse uh, FFT. But the real crucial characteristic really is this process is that um, the peak to average ratio of this final frequency shifted uh, signal ends up being the same as that of the original modulating data. In this case, that was uh, QPSK. And this is very different from the OFDMA case that we had for the same occupied bandwidth and the same uh, data rates. So here we can compare the two schemes um, by looking at the, the CCDF curves or complementary cumulative distribution function curve. Um, and what this curve does is it shows the probability um, as a percentage, which is on the y-axis. So <laughs> it's the probability as a percentage, or what I like to say, it's the amount of time that uh, a signal will end up reaching some given level and be at that level or greater uh, above the average power level, which is referenced here um, at 0 dB. So looking here, we can see that the uh, single carrier FDMA curve has um, clearly lower peak to average ratios than the OFDMA, and there's several dB of uh, extra headroom that um, in comparison could end up resulting in a lower cost power amplifier because of the, the less um, spectral regrowth, or perhaps there may be um, no or, or some less costly linearization techniques that may be required, which ends up lowering the power consumption and resulting in better power, um, better battery uh, performance. The frame structure here defines uh, the frame, the slot, the symbol structure, all in the uh, time domain. And there's two structures. There's a, a type 1 for FDD and type 2 for TDD. Now, in, um, in each radio frame, um, it's uh, 10 milliseconds. And that 10 milliseconds uh, consists of 10 uh, subframes here that are each 1 millisecond. And each of these subframes uh, consists of two slots of a half a millisecond. And so there's a total of 20 slots uh, uh, in the frame. And this is the same for FDD and TDD. Now, in FDD, uh, the uplink and the downlink have the same frame structure, um, but they end up using different spectrum. Whereas in TDD, uh, we have to switch in time between the uplink and downlink. And so a flexible assignment for the uplink and the, uh, the downlink Utilizing a special subframe is what allows for the change in direction within a frame, and uh, it also allows to make it better be better able to handle uh, asymmetric data rates.
So now let's look at the slot structure or what's also called the resource grid. And this is very similar for the uplink and the downlink. Uh, first we have here uh, a resource element. Um, the resource element is the smallest unit in the physical layer and it occupies one symbol in the time domain and one subcarrier in the frequency domain. Now the resource elements are used to make up what's called a resource block. Uh, the resource block is the basic unit of scheduling. It has one, uh, uh, one slot which is uh, a half a millisecond in the time domain and 180 kilohertz in the frequency domain. And the, the, the numbers of subcarriers and the symbols in, in these uh, change depending on the cyclic prefix and the carrier spacing. So for a normal cyclic prefix, there's uh, seven uh, symbols and 12 carriers, which uh, end up being 84 uh, resource elements. The LTE frame has uh, physical signals and channels, so let me just give you a brief description uh, of uh, some of these for the downlink and uplink. There are uh, synchronization uh, signals uh, uh, for the downlink. These are all used by, uh, they're used by all the UEs for timing and center frequency, as well as uh, this process and called uh, cell identification. If you're familiar with the UMTS uh, process, it's similar with the uh, scrambling codes and finding the, uh, the code groups. There are reference signals, and there's three types. Uh, there's uh, the cell-specific cell is the most common, and they're used for the downlink channel estimation. And another characteristic is that we, um, they have a known amplitude and phase. And I'll talk about that in, in a bit about how we use that information for uh, testing as well. There are the shared channels, and uh, those shared channels carry the data traffic, and they're shared in time with multiple users, and they can be QPSK 16 and uh, 64 QAM. Then there are the broadcast channels, and that carries cell-specific uh, identification content, and they're modulated at uh, QPSK. Then the control channels. They carry out uh, allocation and control information, such as the transmission bandwidth configuration that we talked about in the, uh, the channel bandwidth section. And then there are some indicator channels, the HARQ uh, indicator channel. It carries the acknowledgments and negative acknowledgments uh, feedback that's used um, uh, by the UEs for the, uh, to communicate that the uplink blocks have been received by the um, eNode B. And then in the uplink, uh, again, reference channels used for synchronization and channel estimation um, and this link adaptation. There are uh, shared channels. Again, just like in the downlink, it carries the traffic data and can be QPSK 16 or 64 QAM. Uh, uh, control channels, again, carries control information such as the scheduling requests, and in this case, um, the HARQ um, acts and negative acts. And then there's the random access uh, channel. And what that channel does is uh, initiates communication with the eNode B and carries preamble information and allows the eNode B to calculate uh, the time domain, uh, time delay to the UE and uh, also identify that. So here we see the frame structure of the downlink. Um, we have it color-coded here uh, with different physical signals and channels just so you can see how they can be uh, mapped in. So let's just take a look at just a, a few of those. So for the reference uh, signals or the pilot signals, um, we can see that they're transmitted here in the, uh, in the first and the uh, fifth OFDM symbols. Um, the primary synchronization signal is kind of purple or lavender color here, it's mapped, ended up being mapped to the last uh, symbol of time slot 0 and time slot 10. So if you look further down, you can see it here as, as well out of the uh, zoomed in part. And then the, a broadcast channel, one more here. Uh, you can see that it's map, ended up mapping to the first four symbols that are in uh, time slot 1. Uh, and both of those, the, the synchronization channel and the uh, broadcast channel you can see are in uh, a centered uh, 6 uh, RB section. Now another way to look at it here is also um, 
the frequency and time uh, view of uh, central 144 subcarriers that are in the downlink. And here you may notice the uh, control channels here in green. They exist on all the subcarriers, um, and it and it's does so at uh, the, the start of the first slot. And you can also see in there the reference signals, which are these blue ones, how they're they end up showing every six uh, subcarriers on the first uh, symbol, symbol zero position, as well as symbol four. So they end up repeating as it uh, as you go out in time. Now. If you look in the center here, you can see a, a narrow allocation of the synchronization signal and the broadcast um, signal or channel. You can see that's uh, pretty clear in there. And this narrow allocation is done in order to uh, make the frame structure um, completely independent of the chosen system bandwidth. And we know that that bandwidth can vary from 1.4 to 20 megahertz, and so we don't want it to have to, the bandwidth to have to affect the, the, that structure. And then we have the modulation depths um, that are applied to each symbol. Those would vary according to the uh, channel type. So let's now let's move on to uh, transmitter, receiver, and test fundamentals. We talked about some of the, the key air interface concepts. Let's talk a little bit about testing. So here I have uh, a basic functional uh, building block of a digital communications uh, transmitter. Um, this basic block here I'm showing, uh, it applies to LTE, though there's probably more levels of integration that uh, would, would be in an actual um, LTE transmitter. There's possibly be um, some sort of transceiver, maybe, or there could be a second uh, transmit band. There'd be additional antennas, and maybe between the RF and the baseband, some sort of uh, digital interface. But in general, the process that the transmitter goes through, excuse me, is uh, how it's here outlined on the left. So we start with channel coding where there's error correction, interleaving, some processing, which is putting it into the frame structure. And then that's followed by some symbol encoding where uh, we map the serial input stream into I and Q baseband signals. And then there's a, a modulation filter. Um, in, Many of the previous uh, standards, there was uh, that would be a, a Nyquist filter, and what we use that for is to ensure that we have uh, accurate data transmissions. And then that'll be followed by uh, modulation, where uh, we use mixers to upconvert the baseband signal to the IF or the RF frequencies, and then amplification and filter. Uh, we do that with the uh, the output to limit the potential interference that the transmitter might have with other transmitters in the areas. And then, of course, uh, gain control, where um, we're able to set the specific power level or adjust the power level of the transmitted signal. Now, the RF analysis is done out here at uh, the antenna, and that's used really to evaluate the complete transmission system. And the 3GPP has um, put together specified characteristics tests uh, to, to do that. And I've grouped those characteristics tests uh, just in these kind of three general uh, categories, and they are uh, the output power, transmitted signal quality or modulation quality, and unwanted transmissions. Um, here they're further described by the names of some of the specific tests, probably some that uh, you may be familiar with, such as channel power, um, the um, EVM, uh, adjacent channel leakage ratio, spectrum emission mass, and also for your reference here, what I've done is I've included the 3GPP technical specs documents um, and, and chapter numbers for the conformance test. That includes the specifications for that test as well as the test procedure. So those tests that we've just shown are used to evaluate, again, the complete transmission system, but yeah, RF analysis is also used in order to evaluate subsystems and their components. And what that would mean is um, it's going to require probing at different parts or different locations within the transmitter. And in here, what I'm trying to do is, is show you how you can end up using the same type of RF analysis software at uh, different points in the um, transmitter chain. And so, for example, we could uh, use this vector signal analysis software along with this logic analyzer here to maybe try to understand the quality and uh, the content of the digital data that would be right here input to this DAC. 
And then what we do is we take that and compare it to um, what's at the analog output uh, of, the, of that DAC. Now, with higher levels of integration and um, increased DSP, um, techniques such as uh, crust factor reduction and predistortion in the baseband of the transmitter adds complexity to um, the understanding of the, the RF measurement results. And that's whether it involves uh, a spectrum or time domain type of measurement or uh, a digital demodulation analysis. So for um, the evaluation of components and subsystems, what we want is an incremental and structured approach where, um, where what we can do is in the system stimulate it with, say, for example, a, a signal generator like I've shown here, and then make successive measurements at these other points in order to quantify the contribution of the amount of distortion or spurious and, and other impairments. So this systematic and structured approach to verifying the transmitter um, performance is really um, set up to follow this verification sequence. And that verification sequence begins with basic spectrum measurements and then continues with vector measurements um, before you end up switching to uh, the modulation analysis. And typically, it's much more productive and probably more efficient to, to go about doing it uh, in these steps, even though um, many times it's pretty tempting just to go directly to the, um, the, the advanced digital modulation. And really, we want to do that process because it actually improves our chance of um, perhaps finding some of the underlying signal problems and identifying those earlier uh, before they end up being masked when we try to make measurements on the, the complex signals. So in, in, ver in doing some of that verification, channel power, amplitude flatness, uh, center frequency, uh, occupied bandwidth, those are all spectrum measurements that can be made uh, on the LTE signal. Uh, with uh, the center frequency and amplitude flatness are more indicative since the um, official definition actually requires digital demodulation. For channel power, uh, that can be measured by averaging the spectrum or by um, doing the RF envelope measurements with band power markers. And most um, signal analyzers have these band power markers already. For power versus time measurements, those are um, pretty much very much interest in LTE due to its varying signal structure of signals that it has. You know, there's different um, reference signal locations, uh, channel locations, and such. And initially, when you're doing this, these can be made without demodulating the signal. And we do that in order just to uh, verify some of the absolute power levels. For CCDF behavior, that also can be measured. In particular, we might want to do that using time gating with the uh, vector signal analyzer. And what that can do is it can provide some quantitative measurements of the signal power's behavior that can be very useful in um, evaluating the different operating points and efficiencies of uh, transmitters. So with that, let's uh, take a look at the results of two measurement examples for occupied bandwidth and then uh, spectrum versus time. So for occupied bandwidth, what I have here is a uh, fully allocated 5 megahertz downlink signal for this measurement. Uh, down here, you can, see, you can we can see we're reading the occupied bandwidth is 4.47 megahertz. And uh, from this measurement, the occupied bandwidth measurement here, what I can do is I can also calculate what the center frequency is from, uh, from the centroid of the um, occupied bandwidth markers. But that's uh, with an assumption that the allocation that we've done is um, symmetrical. And then also looking at uh, the trace, um, we can get an accurate uh, power measurement. Uh, because it makes an accurate power measurement, we can get an idea of what the amplitude flatness would be uh, um, from viewing the trace here and making measurements. The spectrum versus time or the uh, spectrograph, this is really one of the most useful general or non-demodulation uh, measurements for uh, LTE. Uh, the y-axis is time from top to bottom, uh, with the x-axis being frequency. And uh, the power level, of course, is then uh, denoted by the, the various color. And what it does is it allows us to just um, have an overall uh, view of the signal at a glance and, and interpret some of the different characteristics. Uh, we can see uh, some of the major signal characteristics, like uh, the channel types here. We can see there's some um, 
shared channels. And uh, you also can see symbol transitions, and it's really useful for complex signals like uh, such as this in the downlink. And this is very similar to that frequency versus time view that we uh, were looking at when we were looking at the channel structure. Another example here you can easily see is that the control channel here, that there's three symbols of the control channel that show it's being fully occupied over the, uh, the full bandwidth uh, of the uh, signal. So that was the spectrum and vector measurements. So now it's time to focus a little on the digital demodulation techniques. Um, but before you can go about demodding, you have to know and you have to set some of the basic param parameters. Previously, we have been, um, we've had the frequency, the bandwidth, and uh, the input range. And so in this case, what we do for the DMOD is we have the center frequency, the input range, just as we did before. But then we'd want to also know about uh, the direction, either uplink or downlink. And that's because the, uh, the sync structure and the modulation for those two can be different. And then uh, we would want a selection of duplex whether it's FDD or TDD. And then uh, the channel bandwidth and uh, the sync type uh, as well. And then selecting the, the various sync types in there, uh, just doing that selection itself can serve as, a, serve as a form of verification, whether we have a good sync or whether it can sync well or not. Uh, it's, it's just a simple um, level of verification test that can happen. So if we set those parameters, we can do a demodulation on the LT signal, um, and we can end up getting traces or measurement views uh, such as these. Uh, modulation quality is really one of the most critical uh, transmitter tests. It en ends up measuring the amount of distortion in the transmission, and it usually affects the ability of the receiver to decode and uh, process um, the signal with a minimum amount of uh, errors. Now, in addition to the composite EVM, which is a required measurement by the standards, it's really desirable also to measure the EVM of the, the reference signal, and we want to do that separately from the data payload. And this requires some sophisticated demodulation and post-processing tools. And that's what, I'm, that's what I have here with this LT analysis software on the um, 89600 vector signal analyzer. What it does is it, it can provide a number of different uh, EVM metrics, you know, including the uh, composite signal that I mentioned is needed, um, measuring the data channels uh, EVM separately or the reference signals EVM. And then there's also some quick checks for uh, frequency error and such things as the uh, synchronization correlation. And that number should be close to 100, and that's really uh, how good of a lock we are to that particular sync type that uh, that we've chosen for the, uh, the, the uplink and downlink and the uh, type of uh, uh, duplex. And then also there are um, some auto detection of the cyclic prefix and some cell ID information that's here. Now in addition, in, uh, in the frame summary here, we can see individual active channels and signals. We also get a look at uh, the IQ constellation and next to that, we have error vector spectrum, which is EVM versus carrier. And we have error vector time, which is EVM versus symbol. And then we also get uh, a spectrum display. And from there, we can determine things such as occupied bandwidth. In this case, if we look at it, we, we can see it's um, about uh, four and a half megahertz, and that would represent a fully uh, allocated signal. And then if we use band power markers in there, we can get a measure of the aggregate signal power. Now, as we're doing modulation analysis with the software, a real powerful capability of this is to um, use the coupling of markers. And this is really useful for LTE because LTE typically has a large number of symbols per frame or signal elements such as channels or reference signals or subcarriers. And what, what this coupling does is it uh, allows us to understand and identify characteristics of a symbol in the time, frequency, power, um, and error all at the same time. So with, uh, with the markers coupled and all of the signal and channels uh, selected here, and we can do a peak search. Um, and we do that in this 
error vector time mode. Um, what that does is it ends up showing or putting a, a marker on the, the largest error in, in the subframe. And then for that trace, tracee, if we look down here on the bottom, I've kind of highlighted or tried to redo this to make it a little clearer for you. But in the bottom, we can see for that tracee marker that uh, it's 64 quam uh, modulation. It's the shared channel, and that's from symbol 11. And it ends up being located on um, carrier 150, which is on the outer uh, edge. And then if we go back and look at the marker in the IQ constellation, we can also see that it's at a high, uh, a high power state, so you know, for very far from the origin. And then looking at the error vector spectrum, we can see that the error, so all these markers represent the same position, that we can see this high error is consistent um, with what we would expect in the error vector spectrum that shows the uh, highest errors at the cell edges. So now let's move and talk a little bit about the receiver. So in the, in the same token as we did for the transmitter, the basic functional blocks here in the receiver, um, this, this works for LT as well, and though there, again, is probably more levels of in integration, there might be, a, again, a transceiver, there would be perhaps a second receive channel, uh, additional antennas, and probably um, some sort of digital interface between the RF and baseband. And the, uh, the process that it goes through is pretty much just the reverse of the transmit. Um, but the main objective of the receiver uh, testing here is to make uh, performance measurements, on, again, on the complete receiver um, system. And in the same token, the 3GPP has put together some specified characteristics um, tests here that uh, I've grouped into these three sections, uh, sensitivity and dynamic range, susceptibility to interference, and uh, unwanted transmissions. And similarly, what I've done is, you know, given you the uh, reference to the technical specifications uh, docs that has the specs and a test procedure. But um, these characteristics here are uh, performed in what we call open loop, and that is um, uh, with, without feedback. And the 3GP specs, though, to have full or complete verification of the overall uh, receiver performance uh, requires closed loop testing with feedback through um, a faded channel. So in the receiver, um, there's many factors that can influence the performance, and so just like we had in the transmitter, it's useful to consider uh, receiver sub-blocks and components in order to test for uh, uncertainty contributions. So the front-end AGC or um, automatic gain control has to account um, for the downlink uh, high peak-to-average ratios, which can be um, greater than 10 dB, and it has to do that so that the amplifiers can handle the peaks and, and not distort. In addition, um, when, it's, when it's being used, the, the AGC, the phase changes that can occur because of the multiple gain stages uh, can affect the demodulation signal quality, and that has to be tested as well. Uh, receiver EVM, that can be used to give an indication of impairments such as um, non-ideal phase response, as well as IQ imbalance and, and compression. So, Let's take a look at a couple of uh, measurement examples for amplitude flatness and uh, linearity. What we want to do is we want to measure the channel heat, measure the channel and ensure that it's flat across all bandwidths. We know for LTE uh, it has some very wide bandwidths, and so we want to ensure that it's flat um, up there, particularly on the band edges where, um, for FDD, we have duplex filters that can uh, attenuate uh, the edge of the signal. And also, uh, undue phase linearity errors or uh, poor response can result in degraded uh, EVM. Now, the receiver can do some, some of this correction in itself, but in order to do this, um, you're relying on the, re the receiver to do this with the, uh, the reference signal, and that can degrade the signal to interference plus noise ratio, or the SINR. And so the, re the way uh, the receiver front end can be tested for amplitude flatness and phase linearity is by uh, stimulating it with an LTE signal and then demodulating it. And if you take a look at this, and it may be hard for you to kind of look at um, 
some of the display here, but for the flatness, the um, dB per division is, we're showing here, is about 0.05 dB, and so the range on this measurement here is about uh, uh, 0.15 dB, a kind of peak to peak, and then for the phase, it's, uh, it's about 2 degrees uh, peak to peak on here. So we just reviewed uh, some of the RF front end measurements. Um, the baseband has measurement goals that I've stated here. And the question at hand is, is it possible to test the, uh, the baseband independent of the RF section? So digitized signals are sent to the baseband where the FPGAs and ASICs um, perform the demodulation. And, but now the receivers have to demodulate the signal and provide the results. Another challenge with testing the baseband section is how to physically deliver the test signals. Uh, depending on where the receiver is in the development cycle, the test signals that you might want to use could be either RF, uh, IF, um, analog IQ, or um, digital IQ. And further, for LTE, the digital IQ may be required to be an industry standard digital interface such as CIPRI or DigRF. Um, there are solutions available today for this, such as the um, Agilent uh, RDX that's shown here for uh, DigRF. Now, I mentioned that the receiver could be in uh, various stages of the development cycle. Another solution to test this is to combine design software with test equipment to configure what I call an integrated design and test solution for RF mixed signal receiver hardware testing, quite a mouthful. Um, specifically, this example is for um, an LTE downlink open loop uh, bit error rate throughput test. And so let me just kind of explain this uh, in steps a little bit. What, what I have here is a system view, which is a design software package, and I have a workspace in here that creates a uh, LTE signal, um, and it does that with uh, known data traffic and then downloads the signal basically to the MXG signal generator, which ends up upconverting it and stimulating the uh, receiver front end. Then the signal goes through to the device, and it ends up being captured here at uh, the output of the ADC. And it's captured by the combination of the uh, logic analyzer and a uh, VSA uh, uh, vector signal analyzer software, which could reside either in the logic analyzer or uh, over here in the PC itself. Now, the captured data is processed actually in system view um, in that workspace by a simulated LTE baseband receiver. The timing and the synchronization is, is handled within the system view, and it ends up calculating and reporting out the um, LTE bit error rate and the throughput. So you've seen a few examples of our test solutions, um, but our LTE portfolio actually provides design and testing um, provides for the design and testing needs all the way across the entire life cycle. And we start with uh, early design simulation and continue through development, uh, integration, validation, and uh, conformance and manufacturing. Our products end up being um, very complete and advanced because really we're, we're kind of at the forefront of these new technologies. We have technical experts that are very active members, and they end up providing leadership on over a dozen uh, telecom standards and committees all around the world. And what this does is that allows us to have uh, and to gain insight on where the industry is going and what challenges there are, and then we design measurement solutions um, into our products uh, based on that information. One of the most uh, prominent co committees is the European Communication Standards Institute, and on, on that one we have several participants, including some that are working on the working groups that define the LTE conformance standards. Uh, in addition, we have tools uh, that help you study these new technologies either through various technical content, such as the LTE book, which this is based on, application notes for LTE and LTE Advance, uh, videos on our YouTube channels, uh, as well as hosting symposiums and seminars like these. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it back to you, Allison, for uh, questions and answers. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, before we start the Q&A session, I'd like to remind everyone about our survey today. Agilent holds many free webcasts throughout the year, and we ask that you take a couple of minutes to complete the feedback form that will appear 
when you close the WebEx session. This enables us to deliver the content that you need. All right, now on to the Q&A. If you have a question, simply enter it in the question window. Uh, now, Frank, here's your first question. Okay. So you mentioned testing baseband independent of the RF. How can the baseband be verified? Okay. Well, for FPGA verification, um, our systems views LTE baseband library. We have a verification library that has um, a full baseband coding and decoding functionality for like CRC, uh, turbo coding, rate, uh, rate matching. And that can be used to generate test vectors at various stages uh, along the LTE coding or decoding chain. So say, for example, you're writing a HDL code for a uh, scrambler block. You can take the input to system view scrambler block to generate test vectors. Um, and then what you would do is you'd, you'd input your HDL code, and then you'd compare the output vectors of your HDL code to the system view generated vectors. The nice thing about that is that it allows you to independently check your HDL code uh, with a commercial test vector reference uh, rather than writing your own. And then um, if you're doing FPGA hardware tests, you could use a dynamic probe to, um, to measure at intermediate stages within an FPGA implementation, say before and after FIR, and then using that probe along with uh, the logic analyzer and VSA software like I showed, you can evaluate and debug the FPGA design and measure the impact that the FIR is having on EVM performance. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, second question, how have LTE deployments been going? Okay, well, that's one thing I didn't, didn't really talk about here much, but um, LTE in itself is, um, it's been very well accepted. It's growing actually very fast. Um, in fact, um, of the networks that have launched um, in the last year, of the total number of network, LTE networks that have, that have been uh, launched, just in the last year alone, 67% of uh, all the new networks have been launched um, just in 2012. Um, the GSA also estimates that um, by the end of 2013 that there's going to be uh, approximately 230 or so uh, deployments by the, uh, the, the year end. So it's actually really growing very quickly. And I might add that uh, it's probably also interesting to note that uh, the most popular frequency band is uh, the 3GPP's band 3 or uh, the LTE 1800 band, which is um, in large part due to the reforming of the GSM bands. Okay, good. Thank you. Interesting. Um, one last question quickly here. Uh, I know you didn't discuss it here, but can you talk a little bit about the Zadoff 2 sequences? Okay. Um, the, the Zadoff 2 sequences actually have um, some useful properties as it relates to LTE. Namely, they have a low cross-correlation, they have zero um, autocorrelation, that, that is uh, its orthogonality, and um, a constant amplitude. And um, these sequences are, are used in a, a number of the channels in the uplink and the downlink, uh, most notably in the uh, primary synchronization channel. And by um, using it with the Eno B transmissions, it reduces the inner cell interference and it makes it easier for the UE to uh, decode and get the cell ID. Um, and in addition, the constant amplitude nature of the signal helps to reduce the, the cost and the complexity of the uh, power amplifier uh, uh, um, power amplifier designs. Okay, great, thank you. And it looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. Thanks again for your presentation, Frank. And as we wrap up today's presentation, remember that we will email you a link when the on-demand version is ready to view, along with a copy of the slides. If you're currently viewing this on-demand and have a question about any of the material, please do email Frank at the email you see on your screen now. I'd also like to remind our on-demand viewers to please complete the survey that will automatically launch at the end of the webcast. Thank you again for attending today's event, LTE and the Evolution to LTE Advanced Fundamentals webcast series brought to you by Agilent Technologies. Please visit us at agilent.com slash find slash events 
for more details on our future webcasts. There you can register for the second part of this LTE webcast series, which will take place on Thursday of this week. The copyright of the presentation materials is owned by Agilent Technologies.